Let me introduce you to one of my favourite bands, Ash, and possibly their greatest album, 1977. Um, maybe another time, besides 1977 Rocks Harder. Well, we're doing 1977, get over it. This is where it began. That was an EP, smart ass. Or is it a mini album? What the hell is Trailer? Not as good as 1977 though, so... What are you going to do? I'm going to talk about 1977. And she never told me her name I still love you to go from Sitting in a dreamy days by the water's edge On a cool summer night Fireflies and stars in the sky Gentle glowing light From the cigarette The breeze blowing softly on the No, no, really, these are Ash. I was introduced to Ash in my youth via the original PlayStation game, Gran Turismo. Among another band which I will get to in another video, hopefully. This game was probably the single biggest push into a world of dirty indie rock music than any other medium, and one of the biggest standout tracks was Lose Control. If that track came on, it used to focus me and I felt invincible driving around the tracks of the time in my heavily modified Mitsubishi GTO, which is faster than the Skyline by the way. I adored the music though, I used to go into the menu and just listen to the music rocking out to the high energy post grungy rock sounds. In 1992, in the Northern Irish town of Downpatrick, a group of teenagers looking for something to do went to set up an American football team. Fortunately, I decided to scrap that and joined a metal cover band instead, known as Vietnam. The band used to cover bands such as Iron Maiden. Badly. Well, um, to begin with, um, I met Mark when he moved to my hometown when we were 11. And sort of, I think around that time, it was American football was a big craze. So uh, we were, I don't know, he had some mad idea about getting an American football team together. And, uh, but like, we sort of looked into it, buying all the equipment, and it just seemed really expensive, you know, all the gear. <laughs> it's a crazy idea, anyway. Like, to join some sort of league, anyway. And then, yeah, so we've, that sort of fell through. So then, for Christmas, we all decided, like, about 10 mates to get guitars and like start a band or something and so everyone did except just the two of us were the only ones who really stuck at it you know and that was Vietnam <laughs> well we were sort of into like Megadeth and Iron Maiden and lots of like metal so but, that's what we were trying to sound like but we weren't we weren't actually good enough at our instruments to play any covers so we had to write our own songs from the beginning and they were always like a bit more melodic and almost I guess they sounded a bit more punk just because we you know or ineptitude. We kept that band going for three years and then, you know, we just got kind of sick of the other guys that we got in the group because they, you know, they weren't very committed really. So we, we just, and around about the same time we discovered Nirvana, so we got really into like a whole punk rock thing and that's when we met Rick and he joined the band. He, he was like a geek in the year above us in school. We decided to call ourselves Ash and then like a week later we were in, in the studio and did our first demo tape. And that was just like, it was the beginning of summer in 1992. Then we posted the old drummer, the demo tape, through his door. <laughs> that was whenever we found out he was fired. <laughs> it was pretty good. He was 19 and we were about 14, 15, so it was quite something to get sacked by <laughs> someone who's like four years younger. Even. Out of the ashes of this project, pun intended, three members would rise. Tim Wheeler, lead guitar and vocals. Mark Hamilton, bass. 
and Rick McMurray drums. Allegedly, Ash got their name as they read the dictionary, and it was the first word they all agreed the band should be called. Prior to this, Ash were called genuine real teenagers, which if they had the staying power that time has afforded them, that may have dated really fast. Steve, you met Tim and Mark around the age of 16, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think Tim and Mark have been playing together actually since they were like 11 years old. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, I hooked up with those guys when I was about, I think I was like 16, they were still like 15. And that was like the, the start of Ash. They'd previously had another band, so we kicked all the other members out, sort of stripped them down to just the three of us. Mm-hmm. And like, a, sort of like, before I knew it, like a week later, we were recording our first demos. From 1992, Ash put out five demo tapes before Try the EP. Or is it mini albums? Oh, is it an EP? Anyway, they were Solar Happy, Shed, Home Demo, Garage Girl, and Pipe Smoking Brick. Most of the tracks from these demos would find themselves onto trailer. In 1994, Steve Taverner came across a copy of Garage Girl demo tape and signed them to his label, La La Records. He put the money up to press 1,000 copies of Jack Names of Planets on 7 inch records. Taverner has since become their full time manager. He took the band to London to play and promote, where record deal was picked up by Corder Marshall in 1994 from Infectious Records. Trailer was produced, and the rest is history. Okay, now it's time for two highly esteemed music industry guests to come and talk to you. Um, Stephen Taverner is one of the brightest stars of music management today. He personally broke US bands Mercury, Rev and Pavement, and his current roster includes bands such as the Ting Tings and Mercury Music Prize nominees All J. Um, Corder Marshall has a CV like a who's who of music. As an A&R director and label boss, he's personally signed such acts such as Take That, Muse, Zero Seven, Niles Barkley, and personally overseen the careers of people like Madonna, Green Day, Red Hot Chili Peppers, so pretty serious. He's also looking after the Temper Trap, and again, all J. So these guys really know their stuff, and they're at the top of the tree. So I'd like to welcome Briggy back to the stage and give a very, very warm welcome, please, to Stephen Taverner and Corda Marshall. So you two sort of came together with Ash, um, who are very, very young when you signed them. Um, tell us a bit about how you signed them and how you, you know, came to be working together on them. Well, we, we started working together. I, I, had, a, I had a 10 year experience, at, a 10 year sentence at RCA. And I, I got summarily uh, fired for signing Take That um, and spending a million and a half quid and putting out three singles that were all stiff. So, so I ran away with my table doing started my own company, Infectious, in 93. And the first act we signed there was a band called Pop Eat Itself that, that my wife had signed in publishing and then I'd signed at RCA. And Tav was the plug so, so we went to Tav to say, we've got this crazy little band, blah, 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 can you get it on the radio? He went, absolutely no way, but I'll, I'll give it a go. And he got it on the radio, and it worked. And so that, that was the beginning of the relationship. And then um, one of the press guys that Tav worked with kind of kept going, oh, you London guys, you're also very cool, you don't know, the best band in the world is in my little village in Town Patrick. And, and, so, and then, you know, so he, he rang me up and said, I think I found a really good band. And they were 15 at the time. So we went over. Yeah. We stayed in, the, in Tim and Tim's house. Um, his dad was a judge. His, we, had, we, 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 uh, we stayed up late talking to his dad. Um, we slept in, in one of the brothers' bedrooms on bunk, on bunk beds. We got up in the morning and had breakfast with the band, all in, all in their school ties and stuff. I think you went for a walk with the mum, with the dogs. I did, yeah, I did, yeah. That's what lay her fears. <laughs> I am yeah. going to look after your son. They were, the court doesn't right, really, honestly. They were, don't worry about it. They were 15. <laughs> um, I signed it for 12 grand at the time. Because actually that was the only, that was all the money I had in the bank account. Um, but I just didn't tell him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you spunked it elsewhere. You just literally yeah, got twelve yeah. grand. So we signed them, and uh, we spent two years developing it. They'd written "Girl from Mars." Um, you had to write to the headmaster saying you wouldn't make it a hit. Yeah, he was. He was we're nervous about them going out on the road during school term time. In fact, there was a there was a half term coming up, and they got offered a tour with a band called Elastica, and uh, I had to go and see see the headmaster to get permission for them to do it. 
first of all, he made me stand outside his office for half an hour, which was a bit embarrassing of all the kids walking past. But then he, um, and then he said, you, you just got to make sure we do homework every day. I'm going to give you the agenda. This is what you have to do. So I tried on the first night. They did a little bit. On the second night, they did a little bit more. On the third night, he's totally get lost. No way were they doing any homework at all on that one. <laughs> And did, was it hard to sort of work with them as youngsters, sort of who are growing up anyway as young men, into but also in the music industry? Because there's temptations galore, isn't not, it? Not, not, not at all. When I, I did, like I said, I had ten years sentence at RCA, and and from a scout up to kind of running the A&R department, um, and I had I don't know forty five acts, a staff of twelve people, a eight million pound budget. Um, and when I left there and started Infectious, I had a kind of self-imposed rule, primarily because I had to deal with a lot of shoddy, um, um, annoying musicians, um, mid-twenties, uh, cocky, arrogant, um, and I kind of made a policy decision when I started Infectious that I was only going to sign artists who are under 20 or over 30, because I'd, I'd had enough of dealing with stroppy 26-year-olds who, you know, where's my where's my hundred thousand man video? Where's my poor page ad in in, in me? I'll do top of the pops if you get me that, but I'm not doing any promo. So so I was kind of a little bit burned by the the muso mid twenty thing. So so we made a policy decision: young, enthusiastic, exciting. You can train them. You can put them around good people. You can encourage them, and really that they worked on a drop. And there's it's, 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 it's a vitality with young with teenagers. And then over 30, because you can have intelligent, articulate conversations, they've gone through the mill, they've already had a couple of deals, they've been dropped, you can discuss it, you know. So we signed Garbage, who were you know, 35, 40, you know, we signed Oakenfold, who was in his late 30s. Uh, we signed Ash, who were 15. I signed Muse when they were 17. Because um, I only wanted to work with kids or grown ups. Nothing Muse more. were fantastic. Nineteen seventy seven was destined to go to number one in the UK sales chart before the album was released, just on pre orders alone. The album was tied together by this year and heavily inspired by it. It was the year that Tim Wheeler and bassist Mark Hamilton was born. It was the year some of Ash's UK influences at the time included Damned, Dam Damned, and Sex Pistols, Nevermind the Bollocks came out. There are also heavy Star Wars references throughout, which again came out in 1977. These references include a TIE Fighter sound that opens up the album, leading to lose control, an ending with a reference to the duality of the Force with Dark Side, Light Side. Although not on the album, some of the references to Star Wars continues with a cover of can the Cantina Band song on the B-side of the single, Girl From Mars. Also, really love Star Wars. I like those Ash yeah. Wars hats you had. Too. Yeah, did the yeah. band make those for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Those are wicked. He was awesome. Yeah, they're so cool. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Who is the ultimate your favorite Star Wars character? Uh, I think it's Han Solo. Okay. Yeah, you know, he's a bit of a renegade, and he's cool as well. And he's sort of, he's not quite the main hero, but he, to me, he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, going back to the title for a second, 1977 had to do with three separate things. Yeah. One was the release of Star Wars, the yeah. second one was two of the band members were born then, and yeah. the third one were a bunch of essential punk albums were released in that year. Yeah. So for you, what are your essential punk records? Um, well, I guess, yeah, the Sex Pistols, uh, you know, never mind the bollocks. Uh. Yeah, Sex Pistols asked us to do their new tour, but we don't think it's really up to much, do we? The Sex Pistols reforming. So, what, what do you exact? What do you think about the whole Sex Pistols thing? Uh, it's a bit lame. Isn't it? No, I don't care at all. <laughs> Did you like them when they were like 
you know, back in the day. Oh, it was two then. <laughs> no, it was not. But everyone knows. It was not as well. <laughs> but everyone knows you're a rock and roll band. I heard you, in fact, signed your first deal when you were one and a half. Yeah, yeah. that's true. So you must have liked the Sex Pistols. Of course. Well, Same actually, I did, I did a, a short stint. <laughs> <laughs> a short stint as guitar player in the Sex Pistols. Just right. Just on that. But that was in one of their more quiet periods. Well, no, it was, it was, um, I, was sort of, I was too good for them. Well, I can understand I that. But listen. I was a triangle player in Public Image. Really? <laughs> I thought so. They had, they had a very original triangle line, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done, you've, you've had all these offers, you've turned them down. Turned down to what's happened to their face. You've turned down who? To what's happened. You turned them down to their face. Why? Do you think they're whack? <laughs> yeah. Whack? I like that one. London Calling, The Clash, also the first Clash album. Undertones, first album, and. Buzzcock singles going steady. Those are those are maybe my four, Buzzcock. four or five. I, yeah. I just got to interview Buzzcocks last week. No way. Yeah. Yeah, they're in Toronto, so it's just. Did you chat to Steve Diggle? Yeah, I did. Yeah, he's awesome. Oh, he's right? a legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is so cool. I love him. I love those guys. On the Being a teenager is a common theme in and around the album. Before 1977 was set on as a title, the working title, Guaranteed Genuine Teenagers, was looking to be the title of the album. Amongst other suggestions, I'll get to those in a while. Even the photographic cover of the album was a photo from the famous 20th century photographer Edward van der Elsken. Famed for capturing the contemporary underground youth culture of love, sex and music of the time. Right. 1977 enjoyed the talents of Welsh producer Owen Morris, fresh from working on The Verve's Northern Soul, Oasis's Definitely Maybe, and What's the Story Morning Glory, and would go on to produce Be Here Now and work with bands like The Fratellis, Kaiser Chiefs, The Paddingtons, and The View. Owen bought out the best in the band, and the band would listen to his input although perhaps not as far as Owen's suggestion for a title of the album, Owen's Angels. Okay, well what about the perception of the band outside? I mean, just two things. First of all, you have a producer who does the first album for you. And people say, oh, the guy who did the Oasis album did the Ash album. And yeah. people think, this guy does the album. It wasn't like that, was it? It was always 50-50. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, it was real collaboration. I think he's got a lot of respect for all of, you know, for us, even though we're young. He, he takes us very seriously. and. We've got a lot of respect for him, so it was, it was like having you know, an extra member of a band, really. You know, we'd, we'd take his input or, you know, tell him to get away or, you know, the yeah. same with us, you know. He could tell us if we were doing something stupid. Released 6th of May 1996 and recorded at Rockfield Studios in Monmouth, Wales, the recording studio has been used by artists such as Mott the Hoople, Black Sabbath, Motorhead, Queen, Echo and the Bunnymen, Iggy Pop, Stone Roses, The Charlatans, Oasis, The Stereophonics, The Coral, Kasabian, The Wombats, The Maccabees, Raw Blood and The Sherlocks amongst many others throughout the ages. In 1961, in an attic in their parents' house, brothers Charles and Kingsley Ward designed and built their first recording studio. The studio was mono and equipped with a ferrograph, an EMI 301D quarter-inch tape recorder and an eight-channel audio Elcom mixer. Its primary use was to record their own group. By 1962, this facility became one of the first commercial studios outside London, when local rock groups hired and paid for the use of it. The company was originally called Future Sounds Limited. In 1965, the studio was relocated to an adjacent granary. The equipment had been updated to an EMI TR90 and Philips stereo tape recorders, and the console was built by Rosser Electronics in Swansea. In the mid-60s, the premises became the world's first residential studio after an American rock group called Elephant's Memory recorded and was accommodated in Charles and Kingsley's parents' house. Artists like Dave Edmonds' Love Sculpture and Andy Fairweather Lowe's Amen Corner were now using the new studio, and in 1967, the original concept of the much acclaimed Mott the Hoople were all helping to establish the studio's identity. In 1968, the third studio was constructed in an adjacent stable block. The company had been renamed Rockford Studios after the local village, 
and this studio is now the present Coach House Studio. Now 8-track, this new facility was soon playing host to groups like the Early Black Sabbath, followed by many artists including Hawkwind, Arthur Brown, Ace, Bringley Schwartz and Dr Feelgood. The mixing console now was a Trident TSM and the 80s saw more success with artists like Adam and the Ants, Echo and the Bunnymen, Robert Plant and the Undertones. One, two, testing, one. In 1987, the world's first VR console was installed in the coach house, along with added drum rooms and isolation booths. The studio itself has changed very little to today, and still has the original pegboard acoustic treatment from 1968 on its walls. In the 90s, success followed success when the Stone Roses spent 12 months recording their second coming album, closely followed by Oasis' What's the Story, Morning Glory. Since the new millennium, new artists like Tom O'Dell, Kasabian and Royal Blood have all used the Coach House Studio, which is now both analogue and digital, with added natural echo chambers and EMT plates, and a Neve 8128 console. The accommodation for the Coach House consists of seven bedrooms with six ensuite bathrooms and a large open plan sitting and dining room. In 1973, Rockfield opened its fourth studio, the Quadrangle, in another adjacent stable block. The original mixer was made by Rosser Electronics, and one of the first groups to use this studio was Queen recording their hit single Killer Queen from the album Sheer Heart Attack, closely followed one year later by A Night at the Opera and the now iconic single Bohemian Rhapsody. These two albums gave Rockfield worldwide credibility. Still in use today from the mid-70s is the original drum room with its moving wall panels as designed and built by Charles Ward. The equipment was further updated with the installation of a Trident TSM console and artists like Rush, Iggy Pop, Black Sabbath and Peter Hamill helped to confirm the studio's reputation. In the early 80s, Simple Minds, along with Clanad, The Waterboys, Edith Brickell and the New Bohemians, all enjoyed success and in 1987, the studio was acoustically changed with angled ceilings, extra booths and natural echo chambers. The mixing console was also updated to a Neve V3, which in turn was replaced by a Neve VR in 1993. In the 90s, old and new groups were using the Quadrangle Studio, including the Pogues, Joe Strummer, the Manic Street Preachers, Teenage Fan Club, the Boo Radleys, Coldplay and many others. Since 2000, this studio has undergone further equipment changes, including the installation of a vintage MCI 500 series console and has attracted many artists, including Catatonia, Paolo Nettini, Heaven and Hell, The Pixies, Thunder and Wilco Johnson. The accommodation for the Quadrangle consists of nine bedrooms, three of which are self-contained apartments. Over 57 years, many producers have become a part of Rockfield's history. From the early years of Gus Dudgeon, Roy Thomas Baker, John Leckie, Hugh Jones and John Anthony, Rockfield is continuing to attract the current top international producers. Loose control blasts onto the scene with the TIE Fighter sound and a heavy punk and grunge wave of sound. The song itself detailing the idea of cheating with a friend's girlfriend with the lyrics such as But you wouldn't say no even though you were with him. In my opinion, a single worthy track that never was. Once 
Goldfinger, the fourth single from the band and released 15th of April 1996 and their highest UK chart entry to date, reaching number 5. Released as a cassette, CD and 7 inch golden glitter and clear record. The single itself was credited by the band as the best song they had written and recorded up to that date. Rumour had it that Tim wrote it one morning nursing a hangover although it was very nearly a b-side until I went asked for Tim to play something he hadn't much time to write anything whilst at school so he bashed out Goldfinger something Tim thought that would be a weird b-track Owen loved it and the rest as I say is history the music video directed by Mike Brady was a disappointment to the band who had very little input into it end up being very bland and straightforward video of the band playing in what is assumed to be a well-dressed basement perhaps a title lyric down in the basement listening to the rain Goldfinger contained the B tracks I Need Somebody written by Mark Hamilton a song he wrote while feeling isolated in hospital Are we recording? I can't be myself when I'm alone. I think stupid things when left to my own. I need somebody to be around, someone to play up to, to feel about. I need somebody. The B track, Sneaker, originally called Easter Island, a song that was written and performed from the band of the same name, Sneaker. Sneaker was a side project of bands Ash and Blackwater. From Ash, members Mark Hamilton on bass and Rick McMurray on guitar. From Blackwater, Barry Peake, who played guitar and vocals, as well as Sean Robinson playing the drums. The original East Zion by Sneaker can be found on a compilation of Irish bands called Laugh Hard at the Absurdity of Evil. The original song was slower and more clear than Ash's take on the song, which was more distorted, faster and grungy.
available only on CD was the band's cover of Smokey Robinson and the Temptations Motown classic, Get Ready. A cover version that had made a very limited release by Fantastic Plastic Records, available on a 7-inch red record in Northern Ireland only, and featured the B-side, Zero Zero. The front cover was a photo of a very young Drew Barrymore. Rock history has always had a bit of a rebellious streak when it comes to live, inverted commas, TV performances. Think of the times Nirvana on top of the pops. Having sold over a million records in six weeks, they're straight in at number nine. Here's Nirvana with Smells Like Teen Spirit. <laughs> and black grape on TFI Friday. upside down but that's the least of my worries at the moment <laughs> very sorry for Sean's bad language again on this show he's still at it outside now so we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry we're very 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 sorry <laughs> sorry now this show Ash in their own device decided to change singing duties and got Mark Hamilton to mime Goldfinger for the British institution of this morning with Richard and Judy <laughs> Stars in the sky, gentle glow and light 
Go From Mars released 31st of July 1995, the band's second single and first hit record, selling over 200,000 make and silver status according to the British phonographic industry scale, topping out at 11 in the UK charts. It was also the single that got the band the first appearance on top of the pops. Guys, and she never told me her name. I still love you, girl from Mars. Sitting in our dreamy days by the water's edge On a cold summer night Fireflies and stars in the sky Gentle glowing light From your cigarette The breeze blowing softly on the face Reminds me of something else Something that in my memory has been misplaced Suddenly all comes back And as I look to the stars I remember the time I knew I'd go Something Mark's mother Miriam Hamilton recounts. It was a dream come true and I'm so pleased for them all. When Mark rang tonight he said he could hardly believe three kids from Down Patrick had made it to top of the pops. But I said, don't knock Down Patrick, you could from anywhere. Mind you, I think the whole town was watching tonight. The release of Girl From Mars was put back due to Tim and Mark taking their A-level exams. It was decided to postpone the release so they could promote it more effectively. There was a rumour that Girl From Mars was actually called Girl From Ards. Ards being a nearby place to Down Patrick. This is false according to Tim. In actuality the song is, is again a call to escapism from Down Patrick with sci-fi influences such as pretending to be in Star Wars Universe or Better Star Galactica. It also references holidays in France having fun and shenanigans with strange kids on holiday. Well, it's obviously the title is a little nod to Girl From Mars. Yeah. And then there's a rover on the front cover. So have you yeah. always loved all things space, all things sci-fi? Yeah, it also, um, my big sister was like a big David Bowie fan okay. and the, uh, she had a kind of, there was a building beside my parents' house that was like an old derelict cottage and she had taken over as her den in the 70s and she had written uh, Life on Mars on the on the up on the wall so we right from the beginning we were rehearsing underneath this you know oh it's awesome yeah so there are a few meanings to it yeah though. yeah there's a bit of like a Bowie connection <laughs> it's a bit of a nod to you know um, Life on Mars too the theme of space continues in real life as NASA used the track as a holding tone for a period of time. All of our representatives are currently busy. Please stay on the line and your call will be answered by the next available representative. The estimated hold time is currently less than 96 minutes. You are currently caller number 32, waiting to speak with a representative. Thank you for your patience. In keeping, Ash weren't a fan of the UK video directed by the late Peter Christopherson. The video was supposed to depict Mars but ended up looking like a multicoloured beach shot. Ash describing the video as a cross between the Red Hot Chili Peppers video, Give It Away.
and the UK TV advert Natural Plus. Natural Plus. Natural Protection. So a US video was recorded by Jesse Perites, featuring the band as a museum art piece. I have no idea if the band preferred this video, but well, this is why there is a US video. Girl from Mars featured more sci-fi and Star Wars influences with B-tracks such as Astra Conversions with Talos Lutrec. And their awful mentioned cover of Cantina Band song. <laughs> This then brings us to the album's midpoint, a far more melodic and restrained side of Ash showing a more open and vulnerable side of the album. us to the punchy kung fu the first single from the album released 20th of march 1995 and reaching the uk chart peak position of 57 which was still their highest chart position they had thus far to be beaten by girl from mars and annihilated by goldfinger of course the song itself is one of those tales of writing a song in five minutes legend speak of 
Some being written in five minutes on Boxing Day 94 at Belfast International Airport and recorded in one take using the Verve's equipment the very next day, all whilst travelling to the studio to record a different song. The song itself contains samples including the intro which samples from the 1980 film Spooky Encounters. <laughs> The film connections didn't end there, including an appearance on the soundtrack to Angus. And being the main title theme to Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx. The sci fi theme continues with B tracks with Day of the Triffids. Listen! Ah! There's two things I like, really like. One's kicking mix and the other's thumping birds. Ingo Star Cruiser. In the midday, we gave a sign. Cruising through the garden district, I was out of my mind. Star Adventures in the hotel room. In the briefest combination, three, two, one. Ash really likes sci-fi and Star Wars, did I mention that? The cover artwork features a photo from the Manchester United and Crystal Palace game where Eric Cantona rushed into the crowd of Crystal Palace fans giving abuse with a flying drop kick. This took place on the 25th of January 1995, only two months before the single was released. Quite a shrewd marketing technique as it would have been a big sporting news event of the time that benched Cantona for a considerable time and even faced jail time for the assault. Oh, what's going on here? Cantona is getting involved with some supporters. Oh, this is outrageous. Legend tells that the band had to ask permission for Cantona's picture on the record. Apparently he wrote back claiming he spits on the record. I only question this as, does this mean they did get permission?
Yeah was Ash's fifth single release from the album, released as a single for 24th of June 1996 and turned out to be their second biggest hit reaching number 6 in the UK singles chart. Not without its controversy as the video was banned by Top of the Pops. I don't know why, must have been all the kissing. Something Mark Hamilton remarked about the cover art for the single saying, The cover is supposed to show two young lovers just around that age. Look, they're in the woods. They have that sort of look on their faces that they might just have done it whilst their mates waited 10 feet away drinking shandy bass and getting effed up on Lambert and Butler. Anyway, that jacket's cool. That jacket is cool. Oh Yeah was released as a CD single, 7 inch record and a limited edition yellow vinyl and cassette. But it was the UK promo version which is particularly sought after by fans as it is considered quite rare. I think it's the cool glittery CD though. The B-Tracks T-Rex Does your mother know features on the single? Let It Flow, written by Tim, is a nice little summary song, starting out with a submarine radar pulse sound. and small written by Mark. 
Sorry, I'm not a review channel. What do you want from me? I like it okay. I'm better with facts. One note I'm aware of is that Owen Morris got Rick to wear a dress and the almost inaudible giggle Tim makes whilst singing near the end of the track is caused by Rick entering the studio in said dress. Listen closely. the third single from the album released on 9th of October 1995, the title of which is a reference to the aircraft in Captain Scarlet. The song itself is about missing someone sexually, especially in lyrics like, I feel heaven in you. Unlike many other videos from the album, I assume the band actually liked this one as they had directed it. Maybe that's why there is a rumour that Either an alternative video or on the cutting room floor there is a take of Tim pretending to masturbate. It's a rumour but I reckon that one is completely true. Don't you? Angel Interceptor found a missing element in the band when in 1995 playing live Rick was tasked with giving high backing vocals for the track. It was there the band decided that they may need a fourth member. The single was released in the standard CD 7 inch record and cassette configuration. The B tracks were 5am Eternal, which makes me wonder if it's a reference to KLF's 3am Eternal. cover of John Lennon's Give Me Some Truth.
The Japanese release had Girl from Mars, Kung Fu, Give Me Some Truth, Cantina Band again, and Lutheran Ghost Star Cruiser. <laughs> Lost in You is a very melancholic song by Ashes Standards up to this point in their career, perhaps an indication of where the next album was going. Something Tim discusses saying, It was very emotional and I was losing my mind towards the end of it. The feelings in Lost in You are pretty scary. It was written the day before the album was supposed to be finished, caused by dropping a song called Coasting. As the band recants, It didn't feel like it was destined for 77. There was a lot of pressure on Tim to write and the band to record the song in time. To Dark Side Light Side, a quick little blast of Ashes post punk and grungy sound before the end. then brings us to the hidden track. Not the only hidden track, but we'll get to that. This hidden track is on every copy of 1977. I remember the first time I heard it, I remember playing the album, nodding off through sheer exhaustion and waking up to a track that is known as Sick Party and being quite disgusted by what I was hearing. If you don't know, the title is quite literal, featuring Mark Hamilton vomiting and other similar hijinks in the courtyard of the studio. Mark's the worst. Sick Party was actually recorded for a layered audio track known as The Scream. A track that the Boo Radleys had contributed to, but was considered too tame by the band, and was ultimately canned until it appeared on the 2008 Collector's Edition. And uh, The Scream is tame compared to The Sick Party. I I assume Sick Party's on it somewhere, but uh, I haven't heard it. You can... uh, you can hear it online elsewhere, but here's a sample. Those who are fortunate enough to have the first 10,000 CD albums printed will have two extra hidden tracks. These have the catalogue number Infect 40, not the far more common Infect 40X. If you rewind the first track you will be regaled with Jack Names the Planets and the B-side Don't Know.
So, that was my video in and around Ash 1977. What do you think? Did you like it? Why don't you give me a like? Do you like Ash? Do you like 1977? Do you think they've done a better album? No. Oh. Yeah, if you like Free All Angels, like Free All Angels, maybe like a different album. But the thing about Free All Angels is that has candy on it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of points for candy. This video took uh, a few months for me to do. Uh, I am going to do some more. So uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, why not hit subscribe? And uh, why not hit the notification so you don't miss this video? If, if you want to see any more, that is. Uh, in the meantime, you can check out all the previous videos I've done over here. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! And is there any parting words you would like to say to your fellow Ash fans?